Lord, Father. We, we thank you, Lord, for this meeting tonight of the fellowship. Thank you for everybody that came, Lord. I ask that you just open our minds to anoint the pastor's lips, Lord. Let our hearts be prepared to take in your amazing word. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Okay, we are on uh, page 171 of the Harmony. Luke chapter 14, verses 7 through 11. <coughs> Continuing instruction in a Pharisee's house. Four lessons. Luke 14, 7 through 11. Luke chapter 14, verse 7 through 11. Page 171. So he's at the, uh, we'll go back and read verses 1 through 6 to set the context, and then we'll look at 7 through 11. It came to pass when he went to the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees on a Sabbath to eat bread. They were watching him, and behold, there was before him a certain man that had the dropsy. Remember we talked about dropsy last week? Water, some, was it water retention or some water? Anyway. Edema. <laughs> that was it, yes, thank you. And Yeshua answering spoke unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful? Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they held their peace. And he took him and healed him and let him go. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a well, and will not straightway draw him up on a Sabbath day? And they could not answer again unto these things. And he spoke a parable unto those that were bidden. What I what I extracted out of this today was interesting is he's sitting at this dinner and his first question or his first address was uh, uh, says uh, to the rulers of the Pharisees he spoke unto the lawyers and Pharisees that's in verse 3 now it says and he spoke a parable unto those that were bidden so now he's speaking to those that are gathered besides the lawyers and Pharisees when he marked how they chose out the chief seats saying unto them, When you're bidden of any man to a marriage feast, sit not down in the chief seat, lest haply a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him, and he that bade you, or he and he that bade you and him shall come and say to you, Give this man place, and then you shall begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're bidden, go and sit down at the lowest place, that when he that was bidden bidden you comes, he may say to you, Friend, go up higher. Then shall you have glory in the presence of all that sit at meat with you. For every one that exalts himself shall be humbled, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Okay, <clears throat> the second lesson is about humility. Jesus uses a parable to illustrate the point. The point was not to raise yourself to a higher status, those who do not exalt themselves by seeking precedence will be raised up in due course. Those who, who do try to exalt themselves will be humbled. The principle here is that the exalted will be humbled and the humbled will be exalted. Pretty simple. Are there any examples you can think of where, and I mean that's really the predominant thing, men are constantly cr climbing the ladder trying to get to a higher position of status, it seems like, regardless whether it's in politics or if it's in uh, religion, um, in the workplace, etc. <clears throat> so the, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and the humbled will be exalted. Okay, uh, the third lesson, Luke 14, 12 through 14. And he said to him also that had bidden him, so now he's addressing the person that is throwing the party. When you make a dinner or a supper, call not your friends, nor your brethren, nor your kinsmen, nor your rich neighbors, lest haply they also bid you again, and a recompense be made to you. 
But when you make a feast, bid the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind, and you shall be blessed, because they have not wherewith to recompense you. For you shall be recompensed in the resurrection of the just. <clears throat> Third lesson is about the proper, uh, is about the respect of persons. <clears throat> Here Jesus addresses his, his host and teaches him a lesson about showing hospitality in relation to fulfilling the law. If one only extends hospitality to those who can reciprocate, then one is only doing so to bring glory to oneself. If one extends hospitality to those who can never repay it, then one is fulfilling the righteousness of the law and showing true love for your fellow man. The lesson is, do not give only, you put in all caps, do not give only to those who can repay you. So when I thought of this, I thought, whenever we do invite people over, it's our peers. It's, it's not necessarily to be esteemed by some higher person or anything. It's just inviting peers over. So is there any instance you can think of where I, I couldn't, honestly, I could not think of a situation where we invited people over necessarily that couldn't repay us. Uh, but we it's, were, it's much broader than that, I think. How, ex, expand on that. Giving. Well, giving, yeah, okay, giving. Do not give. He says, do not give only to those who can repay you. So, I mean, yeah, it is more than just a meal. Today we picked up our taxes, and um, this lady rode the elevator with us up, and she barged in the door before we did and, and told, told the, the receptionist that she thought everything was in there. She didn't need to see him. I don't know who she was seeing because there's several in the building, but she says, um, and we, since we can't claim any of our contributions anymore, and I make a lot of contributions, but I don't get paid for it. I can't. When she left, I said, um, we're supposed to be making them not to be Secretly. paid for. Secretly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Great point. Yeah. Yeah, you should have told her, well, at least you're doing it with the right attitude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, you're quite the giver. Mm -hmm. I guess I was thinking, you know, I got a neighbor and I was going to doing some electrical stuff on my truck last year, and and he'd come down and he he'd help me and everything with it, and he offered to help me. And this goes two ways, so I'm not just pointing the finger at him. I do it too. Anyway, so he's helped me with this electrical. I think that's pretty cool. Well, come to find out, I've got some steel over there that he's seen. And, you know, he's kind of hoping that. Uh, so the, so there were strings attached to the service. <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of, you know, it wasn't like he was going down the street and some guy needed a hand, so he went over there to help him do it. Yeah. He was anticipating, maybe not even consciously for all I know, but he's thinking, well, you know, I'll help this guy out, what the heck. And he's like, that's just the piece of material I need he's got sitting over there in the corner. Yeah, anyway. the, the human heart is... Yeah, it is. And I've done the same thing with the same man, so... <laughs> <laughs> so it was payback time. Yeah. Okay, point number four. Jesus tells a parable of the rejection of the invitation, Luke 14, 15 through 24. <clears throat> when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and he bade many. And he sent forth his servant at supper time to say unto them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a field, and I must needs go out to see it. I pray you, have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. And I go to prove them. I pray you, have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Mm -hmm. The servant came and, and told his lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in the poor, the maimed, the blind, the lame. The servant said, Lord, 
What you did commit what you did what you did command is done, and there is yet room. The Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and constrain them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men that were bidden shall taste of my supper. The feast represents the kingdom of God. The guests are invited to a feast, and those who are invited all make excuses. One said he was too occupied with the field he had just purchased. Another that he was busy proving a group of five oxen. Another one that he was too busy with his new wife. <clears throat> the man who made the supper represents God. The servant who is bidden to go out and extend the invitation was John the Baptist. And those who were bidden were the Jewish leaders of Israel. When those who were the original people intended for the feast rejected the invitation, the master was angry. The master of the feast then sent his servant out to collect the poor, maimed, blind, lame. These represented those of the people of Israel who were willing to accept the invitation, the common people. And beyond that, the servant is sent out to the people in the highway and the hedges. Those people represent the Gentiles who will accept the invitation. Jesus states that those who rejected the invitation shall not partake in the feast. They are that evil generation that he refers to earlier as rejection, at the rejection of his Messiahship. The parable ties into the motif that the exalted will be humbled, the humble will be exalted. The Pharisees are exalted, and the common Jewish people and the Gentiles are humble. Okay. <clears throat> Instruction concerning discipleship. I wish Shirley were here, because this we kind of talked about this uh, Sunday night. Now there went into him great multitudes, and he turned and said unto them, If any man comes to me, and hates not his father and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whosoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring, desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he have wherewith to complete it? Lest happily, when he has laid a foundation, is not able to finish, all that behold begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, as he goes to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and take counsel whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him that comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an amb ambassage and asks for conditions of peace. So therefore, whosoever he be of you that renounces not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Salt therefore is good, but... If even the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is fit for neither the land nor the dunghill, and men cast it out. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Um, first of all, notice this. Um, if any man comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, and children, and brothers, and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple, number one. Number two, whosoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And number three, whosoever you be that renounces not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Now, these three things, are these works? What is the distinction? I, and I, I mean, we've talked about this before. What is the st distinction here? as he's talking about discipleship versus the call to salvation. And is it synonymous that a believer in Jesus Christ is also a disciple? No, just discipleship okay. is different than salvation. Okay. Dis what is discipleship? What is a disciple? A student. Very good, yes, a student. Which why? A disciple is a student. Oh. A student who's who's following the rabbi, who's the teacher. I guess I was thinking it was more of a, a messenger, somebody that went out and shared the message. Didn't know that. So. Yeah. So well, I mean, in, in ter you think in terms of Jesus' disciples, right? His twelve yeah. disciples. 
Well, they were also apostles. So a disciple was a student of Jesus, as they were. They're following him, seeing his ministry, his miracles, hearing his teaching. And they were also apostles. And apostles means those who are sent. So these disciples were sent out as apostles to take the gospel uh, to the Gentiles. Uh, so the apostles is those who were sent? Yes. Yeah, because uh, Terry, Terry Long from Calgary and Salt Lake today, he was on the radio and he was, uh, he was telling, I mean, he was just giving a sermon or whatever, but he's saying, everybody in here is apostles. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know about that. I, I thought that office was just kind of, it was for the 12, and now that's no longer. Yeah. That's what I have written down someplace. That there's only 12 pastor. pillars in the kingdom. Yes. Uh, there's only 12 pillars in the Messianic oh, kingdom. Yeah. Yeah, in the, in the New Jerusalem. The yeah, New Jerusalem. Kind of a reserved spot. For, those were the only men that. But now, see, now see, there's yeah. a difference between the office of an apostle yeah. and apostles in the context of those that were sent. Because if you do look in the New Testament, there are more than just the 12 who are called apostles in the actual Greek language. But they are not in the office of the apostle. It, it kind of troubles me if, whenever anybody kind of insists on having a, a uh, you know, having a title. Yeah. I mean, just to have that title. No, I'm an apostle or I'm this and I'm that because it really insinuates like a hierarchy. I think it's different if you're talking about a preacher, a pastor, and it's somebody is it's the shepherd, uh -huh. and like that, and I use that terminology as a point of reverence because I think it's right and good to do that, but uh, if somebody's, you know, because all over YouTube, that's what they want to be, they want to have this, like, a, they, I don't know what it is. Well, they, yeah, they want to exalt themselves. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm the authority you need to look to. You know, I'm I mean, not just a pastor, I'm an apostle. Yeah, and they'll, they won't tell you that. They'll say it's something else, but yeah. it's look at me, right? Yeah. It's, it's about me. Especially if they got a robe or something with it. Yeah. Yes, and a collar. I have written down from this class, yes. apostles were the foundation of the church, and they had to be eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Christ. Yes. That's the office of the apostles. So remember, they were casting lots to see, Peter was casting lots to see who would replace Judas in the office of the apostle that he was had now vacated by his death. But if you look at the Greek word, if you look at the Greek word, there are others who are labeled as apostles. That word, but the word fundamentally means those who are sent. So in that in that context, there are apostles or men who are sent. For example, I believe, I believe Barnabas is called an apostle. I, I might be mistaken. But um, if you go pull up a Blue Letter Bible and, and click on the, like find the word apostle and click on the link, you'll find the Greek word being applied to others than the twelve. But the office of the apostle, and so not every apostle or sent one, and I'm sure it's in the context of what Terry was talking about. Doesn't have the power to raise the dead. They don't have the power, you know, they, they weren't eyewitnesses of Jesus, but in the context of being sent. And you know, if you remember at Calvary Chapel down there in Salt Lake, they've got, as you're leaving the church, it says, you're now entering the mission field. So I can see Terry definitely preaching how you guys are all apostles yeah. sent out into the mission field. He is about that, yeah. But the office of the apostle, the foundations of the church, with Christ being the chief cornerstone, these are the twelve, uh, of whom I believe Paul is is the twelfth. But Barnabas, so, yeah, and Timothy and Sylvanus. Okay, yeah. But those are not; they're not the pillared foundations of the New Jerusalem. They're not in the office of an apostle. What did you say, Heather? Um, Blue Letter Bible has. Uh, 
says, a delegate messenger once sent forth with orders specifically applied to the Twelve Apostles of Christ, in a broader sense applied to other eminent Christian teachers, Barnabas, Timothy, and Silvanus. Oh, okay. Well, it, the part where they voted on to get that new guy in after yeah. Judas did what he did, yeah. and, and I, I wondered if just through time I kind of wondered did God approve of that because then comes Paul so they voted this guy in and God never really as far as I know he didn't acknowledge it he, one way or the other but Paul came along and Paul said I am the I am a apostle I'm an yeah. apostle to the Gentiles right yeah yeah I'm trying to think what so I wondered if God even acknowledged that uh, the new guy that they brought in after it was prior to Pentecost, and he was never mentioned anywhere else, right? Yeah. Uh, was it a Sunday night? Were you here when we were talking about that? Yeah. Very thing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think that God ordained that as a means of choosing another apostle. The only reference to, the, to Matthias after that choosing of lots, or casting of lots, is it mentions him going out to minister, and it calls him, and the twelve went out. So he's mentioned there, just kind of offhand way, he was one of the 12 that went out to minister. But I don't think that God, again, you don't see his ministry, you don't see... You don't well, they kind of did it by drawing straws or something, didn't they? Yeah. And Peter, yeah. you know, impetuous Peter kind of yeah. was the one, you know, he drew the sword too to cut off Malchus's ear. and right. Oh, I'll love, I love you, I'll die for you, but these people, well, I will, you know. So he's always... Opening his mouth, and he would have been the one to say, "I'm the apostle." <laughs> he did yeah. cut his ear off, didn't he? He did cut his ear off, and the Lord said, "Boop, <laughs> put down the sword, Peter." <laughs> so God never really uh, that thirteenth guy. He never really said one way or the other what he thought about it. There's no indication in scripture. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll never know, but I guess I kind of got a sense of that when. It, because of the way it all happened with Paul after that. Yeah. Yeah, I think Paul is, is the 12th. I think, yeah. there's a, I think there's a strong case for that. Like, well, like you can only have the 12, New like, Testament. <laughs> like Heather said, the, you know, there's only the 12, 12 spots. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think Matthias is on that 12th. Yeah. You know, Paul wasn't on there, but Matthias is in there. I, I don't see that. But I'm not going to tell him, but... <laughs> It is with finance. <laughs> um, so notice this. If any man comes to me, hates not his father, mother, wife, children, brethren, sisters, yea, in his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, I used to read that as though these were, these were um, in kind of a negative context in the sense like, don't even, uh, 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 you've got to do this, this, and this before you can come and apply for discipleship. But really what I think Jesus is saying is the reality of the call to discipleship. I'm just telling you flat out, you cannot follow me as a disciple unless you do these things. Because as soon as you take three steps walking with me, someone in your family is going to raise up and challenge your obedience to me. And you're going to have to tell them no. If you follow me, at some point, you're going to be given a cross. You're going to be rejected and persecuted. There is no easy discipleship. Believing is simply trusting in the reality that Jesus is the Messiah and that He has paid for our sins absolutely free. But discipleship, which we are all called to discipleship. So I don't want to make it sound like we've got a plan A and a plan B. You know, if you, you, know, you just pick or choose if you want plan A. You know, you just have to have, you just believe and have eternal life. And, but, but we also offer a plan B for those who are interested. No, the call of Jesus Christ is to, what is the Great Commission? What is the essence of the Great Commission? To make what? What are we making? Disciples. Making disciples. Jesus doesn't say just make believers, but that's a, I mean, that's a prerequisite to being a disciple, a genuine disciple of Jesus Christ. Now you also find, though, that there were disciples, so there are believers who are not disciples, but there were also disciples 
who were not believers. Oh, yeah. And those were all filtered out. You read in John chapter 6, many of his disciples turned away. So they're, they're following this rabbi Jesus. Uh, he's fascinating. He's, he does miracles no one else is doing. He has fascinating teachings. It's never a dull moment with him. But they never came to the point of faith that he was, in fact, the Messiah. To them, he was just another rabbi that they were following. And, of course, we see in John chapter 6, he filters them out by just teaching. Hard teaching. Hard teaching. Like, who can understand that? And that's a good indication that they were not believers. They couldn't understand his speech. And even if, you know, there were times where, where the real disciples the, who believed didn't understand him. But as Peter said at the end of that, of that dialogue in John where chapter 6, where else will we go? You have the words of eternal life. I don't fully comprehend what you just said, but you are the Messiah. Where are we going to go? We can't go to anyone else. And of course, even Judas, we know Judas, you know, was an unbeliever. He was a son of perdition. He was a disciple. Um, so Peter's reaction what, that you just described is often where I'm at. I don't fully understand the depth of <laughs> this, and I can't like, you know, merge these things that are seemingly contradictory. <clears throat> but where am I also thinking? You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> I don't know what you're gonna do. <laughs> uh, who else is raising the dead? And <laughs> Okay, so next one. Whosoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now notice this too. I pointed this out in the past. When the call is to come unto Jesus Christ, it's a call to salvation. The call to come after me is a call to discipleship. So once a person comes unto Jesus Christ, that's saving faith. And then Christ says, okay, now come after me. Follow me. But here's the cost of that following. Obedience to me. So, so now we see another constraint here. Whosoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Or if he can't play harmonica well, he cannot be my disciple. Sit, you sit around the campfire with Jesus and you got harmonica. <laughs> sing, you sing some old spirituals. <laughs> the booze, baby. Yo. Um, so what does that mean to, to carry your cross, to bear his own cross? Does it mean, well, you know, uh, I've got a bad, I've got a bad hip and I have a fake leg. Everyone's got their cross to bear. Is that what that means? No. No. no you're gonna be persecuted. Persecuted. Okay. Um, Last night we ran into an old friend, Mandy. I think some of you might remember her from the Air Museum. Okay. She used to be an age 60 pilot when we were in Tucson, and now she's here working for Lockheed Martin. Well, you know, she's like a connection to all of our friends that we had in Tucson. And pretty much most of those people at this point think Dave and I are religious enough cases. I'm not kidding. Like, yeah. <laughs> even last night, it was kind of, there was points of awkwardness where Dave, even Dave, as mellow as he is, didn't have a poker face, the thing she was talking about. Uh -huh. She was. She said, oh, I, I was baptized Methodist, but she's talking about her neighbors, and they're all flying gay pride parade you know uh, flags and stuff and dave i don't think wanted charlie to hear this stuff you know yeah. so he was like uh you know <laughs> <laughs> what's the oh dumb and dumber Shh. Yeah. Some finger on there. <laughs> but I, she was still nice enough but there's there's not going to be any real friendship there oh yeah. you know you know what i mean like yeah. It's more like we ran into each other at dinner, so we were nice to each other. But it's not, you know, I don't think it's. Uh, She's lost what that it used love to and be. feeling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are Jesus. Awkward. <laughs> yeah. You prayed over your meal. Awkward. Uh. <laughs> um, so, yeah, persecution. Remember the world. The world gave Christ the cross. I mean, in an earthly context, obviously it's sovereign will of God to atone for our sins. It was an altar. But the world, it was a sign of that hatred and rejection. And so the key element, the more, you know, I mean, it just is more and more convinced every time I study this through. The key element, if you're going to be a disciple, 
and make other disciples, which is this great commission of, that Jesus has given his disciples to make other disciples. That means the key ingredient to disciples, to make disciples, is the gospel message. And so just as Christ bearing the cross was the means whereby our sins were paid for and the atonement was made, we take the message of the gospel, which is what brings salvation today, and now guess what? They're going to reward us with the very same reward they gave to Jesus. Oh, congratulations, Jesus freak. Here's your cross. We will persecute you. And that's why, again, when you look at Christendom today, that's why the, the gospel has been suppressed and it's been replaced with a social gospel. If you preach a social gospel, you'll be welcomed into political circles. Into, you'll have no persecution. There's a church in Reading that's a brewery. That's a brewery? Okay. Uh, I sit at the bar Sunday morning. Is that a Calvinist church or is it like a school? <laughs> that's, that's funny. Don't, yeah, don't they like to drink their brew? Um, so in other words, if you want to be a disciple, you've got to count the cost. And guess what? That means you're going to have to take a cross. You're going to receive persecution for that. Um, for that faithfulness. Um, then he goes into counting the cost of discipleship. Um, I, I remember reading through this, and, and the Lord kind of opened my understanding to um, the second scenario. There's the, so there's the, the, the gentleman, who's the guy who builds a tower, and he just counts the cost. Um, and, uh, and then there is uh, what king, as he goes to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and take counsel whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him that comes against him with 20,000. I always had a trouble, a trouble understanding this, this portion of it. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. If he has 10,000 and the other guy has 20,000, he's going to he's gonna want to sue for peace. But that's not what Jesus is saying. And it was really cool because when, when this kind of opened my understanding to this a little bit more, um, I was serving in Germany as part of NATO, NATO forces. And NATO was outnumbered by the Warsaw Pact, the Russian forces and so forth. They had more overall troops than we had in NATO. But obviously we weren't suing for peace to surrender. And so the context of this is, it is possible for an army with 10,000 to beat an army with 20,000. But you've got to sit down with your generals and figure out how are we going to make this happen. But if you don't count the cost and you just look at it and say, oh, he's got 20, we got 10, we better raise the white flag immediately. That's what he's saying. If we don't count the cost of the conflict, you'll surrender. And the requirement of a 10,000-man army to have victory over a 20,000-man army is the members of the 10,000 army, they have to give their all. You don't have reserves back, make, you know, having the cookout and stuff on R&R &R while the rest of the troops are fighting. It's every man in the battle if you're going to be victorious. So anyway, this is just an interesting text that, that fits in the pattern because if you look at the first example, the first thing is to count the cost, which is, is, is what Jesus is calling us to do. But if you don't, then you're going to fall short and you'll be mocked, ridiculed. And so I thought, why would Jesus then change, change the, the arrangement or the order of this next illustration that a king would, would sit down, you know, and take counsel, whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him against, that comes against him with 20,000, or else while the other is yet far off away, he sends an ambassage and asks for conditions of peace. So this guy, he doesn't count the cost, and the army is still a long way off. They're not even in combat yet. Go quickly, go, 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 and make peace quickly. We'll surrender, whatever the terms are. So anyway, I'm kind of rambling on this. But the point is, yes, if an army with 10,000 has any hope of defeating an army with 20,000, he needs to sit down and count the cost and how it's going to happen. Okay? And so we have to count the cost. It's a conscious decision as disciples. And, yeah, so, uh, so therefore, whosoever does not, of you do, does not renounce all that he has 
you cannot be my disciple. Salt therefore is good, but even if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith it shall it be seasoned, is fit neither for land nor for the dunghill, and men cast it out. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. So, Dr. Fruchtenbaum says, um, <clears throat> well, back in the beginning of the, of the parable, he says, we often use the word love and hate as an emotional sense, but in Scripture, we find that it can also be used in another way. And this is where Shirley asked about the Esau and Jacob question a few a couple of weeks ago, I think it was. Um, to love means to choose. To hate means to not choose. To choose is devoid of emotional content. If we choose one pair of shoes over another and say we hate a pair of shoes and love another, that does not mean that we are emotionally involved with the shoes. For example, the scripture, we see that God chose Jacob over Esau. Believers must choose Jesus over family. Malachi 1, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, it says God hated Esau and he loved Jacob. It means that God did not choose Esau and that he did choose Jacob. And then he, he references Romans 9, 9 through 18. Uh, Anti-missionaries or, or Jewish uh, Jew, uh, Jews today who have rejected the gospel and are anti-missionaries, they resist missionary efforts. They like to use this passage to claim that Jesus teaches one to hate your parents, while Judaism teaches one to honor your parents. This is, a fallacious, this is fallacious, as Jesus is being consistent with the Old Testament usage. That claim would also be inconsistent with other passages, such as Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, where Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. The point Jesus is making is that everything that gets in the way of becoming a disciple must be set aside. Okay. Every time I hear that, you must love your neighbor and hate your enemies, I expect him to say. But I tell you, you must love your enemies and hate your neighbors. <laughs> oh, my, that just comes right there. <laughs> never Maybe said. certain neighbors come to mind. And <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Jesus is teaching three lessons on discipleship. And I love, I love the fruit. This is not the same as salvation, he says. Now see, if you, taught, if you listen to certain preachers though today, they are interchangeable. And so even though they preach, you know, technically they'll preach salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Then they smush discipleship in there and say, and you must carry your cross. If you're not carrying your cross, you're not saved. That sounds similar to the LDS. That, and that should be a huge warning sign right there. When, when a, a preacher is, is in harmony with LDS teaching, that should be a big red flag. And so it is with James chapter 2, when we get into James chapter 2, which we will very soon, right? Probably by Easter, we'll be James chapter 2. Um, but, uh, and, and, and so it's very destructive because it subtly works. In fact, remember, honey, when we were at, um, at the, what was the name, Grace, Grace Church with, uh, Grace Community. yeah, Grace Community Church, which was a John MacArthur spinoff. And the pastor oh, the said... Guy in the hotel? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The pastor said, point blank, if you, you, you must carry your cross to be saved. And that's where I just lost. I think that was the last Sunday we were there. And we had, our, we had a three-hour heart-to-heart. But, um, but that's works. Carrying your cross is a work. Faith is not a work. We're saved by faith. But discipleship has a cost. One has to be willing to leave all. If one's family members oppose one's discipleship, then one must choose Jesus over them. One must decide to bear the cross, being willing to be rejected as Jesus was rejected. Any other examples of being rejected? Heather shared a little bit. A little, that awkward uh, reintroduction to old friends. Anyone give examples of... Uh, someone who knew the old man but now is encountering the new man and it's not real comfortable with that or I, mean, 
I just stay home anymore. <laughs> The welcome mat's not rolled out for you. I don't think I ever had any friends. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was discipleship training. That's what you were doing is preparing for discipleship. Um, yeah. One must count the cost, be aware of what one is doing, and have total commitment with all one's resources. Jesus mentioned salt losing its saltiness in relationship to discipleship. Uh, and then he gives, he gives a, some, a little bit more uh, uh, insight on salt, other scriptures dealing with salt. It's, um, salt purifies and preserves. Savorless salt can no longer season nor preserve. Salted saints have, these are notes I put here. Salted saints have purified out the works of the flesh and the result will be peace with each other. As I was reading this, I was I, I I saw many comparisons with the vine abiding in the branches, or the, the, excuse me, the branch abiding in the vine in John chapter 15. So just as a branch that does not ab abide in the vine withers and is cast in the fire, you see a very similar kind of picture here. Salt that has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is fit neither for the land nor for the dunghill, but to be cast out. And the same thing with those branches in John chapter 15 that were not abiding in the vine, which are believers who are walking either in, well, they're walking carnally for, for sure. Uh, they're no longer abiding in Christ and drawing from His grace and, and, and the Spirit of God working inside of them, yielding to the Spirit of God. And it says they wither, and it says men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they're burned. So it's, it's, it's a, it looks like a similar imagery here of this process of salt that's lost its savor is just like a branch that's not abiding in the vine. It's savorless. So it's a believer who's not walking in the light and obviously is not influencing anyone for Christ. And they're fit for nothing except to be cast out uh, to the dunghill. Um, I hope there's not a dunghill in there. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to avoid dunghills personally. Um, okay. Uh, now we move on. Uh, God's attitude towards sinners. <clears throat> it says, Now all the publicans and sinners were drawing near unto him to hear him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. occasion the Pharisees are grumbling that Jesus is associated with sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes. They think that if he was really the Messiah then he would not associate with sinners. In this passage we perceive the correct attitude towards sinners, God's attitude, which was in opposition to the Pharisaic teaching. Um, let's see, he's got this written down to verse 32. Pharisaic teaching in regard to relationship to sinners was not to have one. For example, Pharisees were prohibited from buying or selling to publicans and tax, collect or tax collectors. Pharisees were prohibited from eating a publican's food because it may not have been tithed. <laughs> That's so crazy. Pharisees were not allowed to invite a publican to their table. Pharisees were not allowed to discuss the laws of purification in the presence of a sinner as they didn't want them to be purified. They may not have been what? With the food? Uh, they may not have tithed of the food. The, so if they sat down with a sinner, mm -hmm. the sinner may not have cut a tenth portion off of the ribeye oh. to give to the Lord's work. So they were too holy to eat that ribeye. 
Probably we just gave him the bat anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, most telling of all, the Pharisees were not permitted to try to be a good example to a sinner lest they repent. Their view was that God rejoices over the death of a sinner. Um, okay. <laughs> Jesus tells them three parables to show the contrast between God's attitude toward the sinner and the Pharisaic attitude toward sinners. The first parable in Luke 15, 3-7 is over the lost sheep. So let's look at that. And he spoke to them this parable saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep and having lost one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder rejoicing. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that even so there shall be joy in heaven over one sinner that repents <coughs> more than over the ninety-nine righteous persons who need no, no repentance. Excuse me. Those who are lost are sought by the shepherd, who is the son. So he points out that each of these three parables deals with an aspect of the, the saving work of the Son and the Spirit and the Father. These next three parables. This first one, the lost sheep, deals with the shepherd who is the Son. There is rejoicing over he in heaven over one who repents and is no longer lost. The emphasis in this parable is on the lostness and the work of the Son who seeks the lost. The next parable is the lost coin. It says, What woman having ten pieces of silver if she lose one piece, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she find it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece that was, I had lost. Even so I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Um, the second parable it emphasizes the searching. The coin is still in the house, but needs to be searched for. The searching is the work of the Holy Spirit. There is joy in heaven over one sinner that repents, in contradiction to the Pharisaic teaching that there was joy in heaven over one sinner who meets death unrepentant. Finally, this, the, the parable of the prodigal son. Um, we're going to close here because I really want to talk at length about this because it, it fits in with our study in James, and I really want to unpack this, and particularly in the context, again, of a branch that is not abiding in the vine, in the vine and how it withers, and ultimately, if it stays in that condition, it will die and be cast into the fire. So next week, we'll start with the prodigal son. That sound, when it's cast in the fire, always, it's like, that's all fire. That's what the whole use. Yeah, definitely. But it's, it's in regard to fruit bearing. And Jesus uh, Jesus identifies every element of the, of the illustration. The father is the husband. Jesus is the vine. And the disciples are the branches. And at that point of the dialogue, Judas has already left the room. He says, "You are, I'm the vine, you are the branches. And Judas is gone. So he's talking about believers. So that's why we know it's not hellfire. Father, thank you so much for your word tonight, God. We are grateful, Lord, for the study and the meditation. I pray, Lord, that your word would continue to bear fruit in our lives. Lord, uh, as we discussed earlier, there's often difficult sayings, Lord, that are hard to digest. Father, even over years, we don't fully comprehend the fullness of a text. And yet, God, it is there like a snow-capped mountain waiting to be melted to bring relief and growth and life and health, Lord, to our spirit. So we thank you, Father, that your word is like the snow from heaven and the rain that falls down also. So, Father, thank you for your word tonight. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick. We pray for Janet. Be with her. We look forward to the results being negative, God, and, and just to, for recovery, Lord, to her difficulties, or just all of her physical difficulties that she's facing right now. We pray, Father, for... Um, 
for Debbie and her uh, treatment tomorrow for her tear ducts, that it would be successful and bring relief to her eyes, Lord, and also, God, just the other issues that uh, are going on, her sinuses and so forth. Bless her. Be with Andrew and Sharon, Lord, who are struggling constantly with chronic health conditions, issues, Lord. Be with them. And uh, be with Brad, Father, and he was struggling with uh, an illness as well. And, and uh, anyway, God, and those I've forgotten that might be ill tonight, help me, Lord, not to go full board uh, into a cold, Lord, and have a hoarseness. But anyway, we thank you, Lord. We love you. Thank you so much for your grace and mercy and patience with us. Help us through the remainder of this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.